Thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. We hung out last night. That was fun. Nice to meet you. Um, yeah, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. I am just going to read very briefly uh, from the opening of this novel, The Dismal Science, uh, which is set inside the world of the, inside like the World Bank, at least the first third of it is, which uh, is sort of an interesting process, trying to talk about other people. Uh, and then it's partially here in New York, and then the last third is in Bolivia. But I'm just going to read a few pages, um, and I'm going to skip a bit too, but yeah. The annual meetings of the World Bank and the IMF had become a kind of rowdy reunion bearing increasingly the muffled bonhomie of a great funeral. At the Omnis and Sheridan's dueling bars, aging dignitaries gathered over strong drink and weak gossip. Vincenzo planted himself at the Sheridan Superior Bar, occasionally reading briefs in the comfortable chairs of the adjacent lobby, but otherwise holding to a tight orbit. The younger attendees still handed out business cards, as if there was some angle to be had, as if someone would remember, as if it meant anything to be remembered. This being 2005, it wasn't lost on anyone that there hadn't been a major economic catastrophe in five years, except for Argentina, and that didn't count because their central bank was just too inept for words. So maybe everyone was starting to feel like they got it right, after all, because the proceedings felt buoyed by a confidence that had been absent before, especially during the troubled 90s, when there was a lot of talk of hegemony, a word that hadn't really seemed to exist before, but suddenly became so ubiquitous as to be immediately exhausting. There in the 90s, crises came huge and frequent, each scarier than the last. Executives sharing elevators exchanged wide-eyed looks, as if pining for a return to the relative sanity of the Cold War. Suspicious of this new tranquility, Vincenzo believed it was all the more important to remain vigilant. There was always, anyway, a lurking danger in D.C.'s autumn months. The city's summer torpor lifted uneven, unpredictably. In the fall, you'd leave your house in a winter coat, scrape ice off the windshield, and by lunchtime, you'd be turning up the air conditioning. Despite the unpredictability of September, the meetings were fine. Everyone was fine. The protesters didn't even seem that upset. What else, what, after all, was there to say? In Latin America, things were great, more or less. The World Bank's programs were going swimmingly, and though, and though he was in charge of the region, Vincenzo knew he deserved zero credit for it. No one deserved credit. The medicine had finally taken, that's all. The emerging markets were now actually emerging. It's almost on autopilot, he said, to half-hearted chuckles from the crowd. His panel was in one of the larger halls at the Omni. The room had only filled halfway. During the Q&A, he glanced at the clock, saw that there were eight minutes left. And what had been said? Nothing. Nothing much was ever said, but they had really said nothing this time. People were transfixed by their phones. At least one of the reporters up front was doodling. She was attractive, or she was young and healthy, and that was attractive. And his recognition of the predictability of his anguish at her boredom was almost as painful as his anguish at her boredom itself. Could it really be so ghastly and predictable? Yes, yes, of course it could. Afterward, he and the, uh, his co-panelists had a half-hour break before they reconvened in a boardroom upstairs for a closed-door session with delegates from major Latin American economies who wanted to explore their evolving relationship with the wealthy countries that had for so many decades been either, depending on whom you asked, bailing them out of self-inflicted disasters or shoving them into disasters and then charging them for a bailout. In any case, these countries were less feeble now. Something had shifted underfoot. It was time to have a frank conversation. Vincenzo was leaving the first meeting when Cynthia, whom he hadn't seen in at least 10 years, approached with that mischievous grin, mischievous squinting grin. Maybe she'd been embarrassed of her teeth as a kid, which were in fact a little crooked, but she always hid them with her lips when smiling. She'd left the World Bank for some leadership role at the IADB years ago, and now here she was, edging toward him with that odd smirk, saying, oh my god, he's alive. Setting his briefcase down on the chair, he grabbed her by the shoulders, kissed her cheeks, and then held her back as if to appraise her. 
How the hell are you? He said. God, I hate being back here, she said. I can't walk ten feet without running into horrible old ghouls like you. He grinned. But you live here, right? Fuck no. I slid over to the UNDP, and they put me in Brazil, and hence, and she waved vaguely at the room. This new job was, strictly speaking, a step down, which was probably why she hadn't broadcast the switch. She'd gone meaty and middle-aged. A sexless pall had fallen over her, as it had most of them, as it had no doubt him. Back when they had their affair, when she was on mission in Peru, she had an impressive body for a mother of three in her forties, and her aura was distinctly sensual. She radiated low-frequency sexual enticement. There was something in the body language, the way she sat down so slowly, how long she held your hand during a handshake, the over-determined eye contact. Even her coy grin seemed dangerous. You just knew she was a pervert. Now she was, what, probably in her late 50s, more battle horse than colt. The carnality had dimmed. Or maybe it was still there, his sensing mechanism was damaged. Worse still, maybe she just didn't turn on the signal for him anymore. So I'm going to skip ahead in the chapter. He goes and does a meeting. She's there. They go and have a drink afterwards. She tries to get a job. It's not really a job. She tries to get, take over some of the World Bank projects. And uh, he basically says, like, we can't do that. It's not going to work. And then and she's sort of flirting with him. She's insisting that she's married. And he's a widower. He hasn't yet told her that. And I'm going to skip ahead to later on in the chapter. Later, back at their hotel room, uh, back at her hotel room, they had sex. And it was about as exciting as running on a treadmill before breakfast. She had put condoms on the bedside table, as if there was any danger of pregnancy or STDs. They didn't use them, thank God. Still, his mind wandered as he stared at her body beneath him, her breasts spilling over her ribcage, sloshing like half-filled sacks of water. She had insisted on leaving the lights on, which was a terrible idea for people like them. <laughs> Despite her best efforts, the whole thing was just carpentry. There had been more passion between them when they hugged earlier, but he had to see it through. Her milky belly, the familiar but foreign manner she had with him, her feeble groans. He observed it all from the very far side of a great chasm. Eventually, just as he was about to fake an orgasm, something happened. The depleted hormones or swaddled synapses, or was it just a dormant part of his soul? Whatever had been absent so far came back, lit up all at once. He grabbed her hips and she squealed in delight. He soon finished and collapsed beside her panting, his pulse throbbing in his skull. She gasped and then burst out laughing. Wow, she said. He grunted, nodding in agreement. That was impressive, she said. Yes, it was impressive. <laughs> Life, again, had just been hiding somewhere, waiting for an invitation. Afterward, once he had recovered, they put on the hotel bathrobes and opened a bottle of Pinot Grigio. Outside, DC was empty, awash in the sickly orange light of a thousand failing streetlights. It was his turn to talk. He had decided that he should confess that his wife had died. It was, he muttered, and then halted, searching for the next word and nodding slowly until eventually he stopped nodding. He stopped there. Thank you. Thanks. That's great. Thank you. Um, so, usually I read to much drunker audiences, <laughs> um, which is, so I don't read this story because in the story, the narrator is a woman, and I feel like the drunk audience often will forget that I'm being a woman, <laughs> and then they'll be confused. Um, so I thought it would be fun to, to read that one here. Um, so I'm just going to read the very beginning of, of the story. Um, just a few pages. Um, and it's called, it's called The Long In Between. In August of 2006, during Israel's relentless bombing of Lebanon, and days after Mel Gibson said his piece about the Jews, I came to New York City to live with a woman who had once been my college professor. Her name was Elizabeth, and she was staying for the summer in a Soho loft 
previously occupied by an internationally famous daytime talk show host. The host had since moved one flight up to the building's penthouse, where he threw lavish parties, audible through the floorboards, a weekly reminder of New York's immutable social infrastructure. No matter how high you climbed, there would always be someone above you. I knew none of this when I arrived from Boston on the Fungwa bus. It was a hot day and humid. The sky was purple gray, clouds swollen with coming rain. My hair was a mess. My bra clasp dug into my spine. I dragged my suitcase from the subway, eyeing the women on lunch break whom I'd come here to become, interns in bubble skirts tapping furiously at cell phones, their legs moving in long, deliberate strides. They appeared to be members of a similar but distinctly different species, a taller species. The elevator opened directly into the apartment. It was an oblong open space decorated in a series of large abstract paintings accented in gold leaf and ugly. The furniture looked imported from a Palm Beach condo, white shag area rug with matching throw pillows on white leather love seats and recliners. The walls were cream colored or creme colored, according to Elizabeth, who occasionally affected a pan-European patois. The other walls were windows. From certain angles, you could see across Green Street into the Apple store. A kitchen emerged at the end of the room, complete with two industrial sinks, whose gleaming hoses wrapped themselves like long bracelets around the spouts. I was not particularly impressed. I'd grown up middle class in an upper class, upper, upper class suburb of Boston, and had spent countless hours in friends' McMansions, just as tastelessly gaudy as this Prince Street apartment. The decor signified a brand of generic wealth that I had come to find provincial. Elizabeth appeared from behind the fridge. Darling, you're here, she said. Welcome. Isn't this place hideous? Elizabeth walked on tiptoe. She still fancied herself a dancer, though she'd quit ballet in college. She wore a terry cloth robe that showed off striated thighs and taut toned calves. She was three inches taller, but otherwise we looked almost the same. Flat chests, no hips, prominent cheekbones, penetrative brown eyes, Ashkenazi noses, and pale skin caked with foundation. It was a look that had failed me through high school and most of college, but I had high hopes for my new life among the sun-fearing sun fashionistas. Androgyny was back after an overdue hiatus. <laughs> Elizabeth, almost 20 years my senior, was the product of previous boom times for heroin chic. She'd spent the better part of the 90s complimenting the look with an actual needle stuck in her arm. After rehab, she managed to buckle down and finish her thesis, a sumless tract on AIDS and the American death drive. The published version had earned her a small following in certain academic circles. Now she carried herself with a jaded self-confidence that attracted men and women alike, but mostly men and mostly gay, and that I did my best to emulate. During my four years of college, I developed what is sometimes called a girl crush, though the term sounds too cutesy for what I felt on Elizabeth. I had taken her class on late capitalism, the syllabus divided between Edward Said and Judith Butler, in the second semester of my freshman year. By semester's end, I had already copied her hairstyle, straightened black bangs, clothing style, gothic airline stewardess, and eating style, SSS soup salad sashimi, and was finding excuses to stop by her office on an almost daily basis. Elizabeth was new to Boston. She'd done her graduate work at Columbia and seemed appreciative of both the company and worship. I saw her as the epitome of urbanity and the embodiment of an academic idol that otherwise existed only in past tense novels by nostalgic baby boomers. Elizabeth and I played out this campus fantasy, smoking imported Galois on the library steps and discussing all relevant isms. But mostly, we talked about the men in our lives, whom we refer to as our dude friends. Dude friend thinks it's his life's work to sperm up my eggs, said Elizabeth once. If only we were lesbians. 
If only, I said, unsure what she meant. Was the implication that we would be a lesbian couple or just a couple of lesbians? I mean, I'm not one of those overpopulation people or the worst, the oh-so-magnanimous doomers who don't want to subject a future generation to blah, blah, blah. But what happens when my son is molested by his math teacher? Isn't that a cross that bridge where you get there sort of thing? <laughs> oh, he'll definitely get molested, said Elizabeth. <laughs> the question is whether to uphold the traditions of our rape shame in society by telling him his body has been traumatized, or refrain from comment and hope he remembers it fondly, <laughs> some kind of passionate hug session from the man who taught him Boolean algebra. <laughs> what kind of school are you imagining this is? <laughs> school of hard knocks, said Elizabeth. When she's decided to sabbatical in Manhattan, it seemed natural that I tag along. I was by then two years out of college, with no life goal except the vague intention to move to New York as soon as I could afford it. Elizabeth was able to secure me an internship in an ad agency run by an old family friend, so long as I promised to maintain ironic distance from the industry's consumerist credo, in much the same way that Elizabeth ironically bought dresses at Barney's. <laughs> she led me to a small room behind the kitchen. The floor was stacked with books and printouts. There was no desk, just a coffee table, couch, and mounted plasma television, unplugged. A week old times was open on the table. The photo showed a bombed out building in Beirut. A shirtless man lay injured in the rubble, trapped beneath fallen pipes. Another man tried to lift him out by the arm, but the injured man appeared limp and immobile content where he was. My office, said Elizabeth. She, she cleared space so we could sit. We lit cigarettes. Elizabeth ashed on the couch. My cousin, she declared with a wave. Or his for now, at least. He bought it for eight, wants to sell it for 10. Old story. And I got to squat here until fall when the market's meant to change. The art and furniture are rented, by the way. I did my best to dissuade him. I'd heard about this cousin, an eye banker. Elizabeth liked to brag about the non-penetrative experiments they'd engaged in as adolescents in Pittsburgh. The cousin was tall and handsome and still felt guilty about these encounters, which he remembered as being only semi-consensual. Elizabeth remembered things differently. In her version, she was the aggressor, but she liked the power position his guilt placed her in. For years, he'd been paying off Elizabeth's Amex. Elizabeth caught me scanning the times. Hideous, she said, just hideous. Women and children they're killing, innocents, it makes me sick. And the macho Republican Zionists like my cousin cheering them on. The last part irked her most. Two things Elizabeth hated were Zionism and machismo. Though she'd flirted with the former on kibbutz after college, Yitzhak Rabin and pharmaceutical grade ecstasy, darling, those were different times. <laughs> And the latter was a trait she proudly manifested. I do not mean to suggest that Elizabeth's sympathy for Lebanese civilians was insincere, but something about the word hideous, the same adjective she used to describe the apartment's art, made me wonder if it wasn't all theory for her, some kind of ideological chess match unrelated to actual suffering. It's terrible, I said, and hesitated, resisting a defense of what I knew was indefensible. Israel was a sore subject between us. I'd been indoctrinated early, and there were feelings from my upbringing I had trouble abandoning. Members of my own family had been exiled from Europe, shipped to Palestine for refuge while their parents were murdered. Besides, the Arab treatment of women and homosexuals didn't seem to mesh with the radical queer feminism we both espoused. You're right, I said, horrible, which it was. Israel was behaving horribly with its showy display of firepower, raining bombs over Beirut as if it were a video game. I'd said so to my father when he defended the attacks, ranting at the dinner table about Hezbollah, spearing a chunklet of chicken on his fork, and waving it for agonizing minutes while he continued to talk. They want to destroy us, he'd said, but it was he with his hate-filled eyes and four-pronged flesh flag who appeared bent on destruction. He and the young Israeli soldiers I'd seen photographed shirtless on the internet, holding Uzis in perfect hip-hop posture. At home, it was easy to argue with my archaic, conservative parents, but out in the world, I fought urges to defend their worldview. 
to fight my leftist friends who seemed to stick up for every minority group except the Jews. There was general agreement that assimilation had happened and anti-Semitism in America was a thing of the past, but I couldn't shake the sense that this dismissal was its own anti-Semitism or an excuse for it. Jews were the new wasps, privileged, powerful, perfect targets for blame. I sniffed my armpit. Take a shower, darling, said Elizabeth. The bathroom's something to believe. <laughs> so we're going to talk amongst ourselves, <laughs> precisely as if we were at the bar. Which yeah. is where we were precisely before we came. Yeah. Here. Now we have to repeat the conversation we just had at the bar, as if it's, as if it's all the natural. Natural. Exactly. Right. It'll be very, it'll be very simple. Yeah. Um, yeah. Let's see. I took notes. I took notes at the bar. I did. That was very good. Um, yeah, I think that there's something about both, I mean, that what your work is doing is something, and I know your, your next book is also involved in finance and mm -hmm. stuff, and I've written writing, and your work as well shows a kind of, you are playing with issues of class, uh, power, money, things that are, for some reason, not the most celebrated. I mean, especially money, I think, is a subject that is something that causes people a great deal of discomfort uh, in their personal lives and in their reading lists. Um, well, you always see characters who don't seem to have a job or it's sort of workplace literature, it seems sort of vague. And I wonder if you have, I mean, your work involves people who are ex sort of explicitly dealing with issues of money and its role in their lives. Yeah, I mean, as does. As yeah. Does here. And we can just sort of compliment each other. That'll be like, you yeah, did a really good job. But, That's but um, yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, it's it's a very important part of, of people's lives. Um, and, you know, it's sort of, I feel like there's this type of, there's this type of fiction that, that wants to pretend um, that there's no such thing, that, you know, that wants to be sort of classless in the right. sense of, of writing about characters where it doesn't matter, you know, who, where they live or who they are. And I, I find that, I find that gesture really kind of <coughs> sentimental. Yeah, to me it feels um, a little sort of antique. There's a kind of a, yeah, a sort of like John Updike thing where it's like everyone is safely ensconced in suburbia, yeah. and their their main problem is their neuroses, right. their sort of middle class ennui, and they. And I think yeah, it's like and one of the things you know I sort of love about both of your books is that we see class. It's like it's like when Obama. You know, during the last election, Obama's sort of making this plea to the middle class, right? right? And his vision of the middle class is like, has this incredible range. Um, like, the middle class in America can mean many different things to many different right. people. And I think one of the things that, that people, um, that fiction can do really well that, that people sort of forget is that there are so many tiny delineations within within the sort of, it's not just like some people are rich, some people are right. poor, and some people are in the middle. Like there are so many steps, there are so many different levels in the middle, and so many ways you can move up and down within that right. middle without reaching those, those poles. And I think, yeah. you know, I think, you know, particularly, um, this is a particularly American thing, right? Because in, 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 in most countries, the sort of dis the, there's this like huge distance between there's there's the upper class and then there's and the working right. class and there's there isn't really a middle class, um, but in America there is and it's huge and it's and it's not it's not all the same as each other. Right. But I wonder why it's still so taboo. I mean, I guess that's why I always wonder why there's so little. I mean, Sam Lipsight, who we both admire, I know, uh, writes a lot about the role of money in people's lives, but I feel like. It's a thing that people workplace in particular it seems a thing that is shunned uh, a lot, uh, and I, I guess it's, is it that ambition is unattractive in a certain way? Well, I think people it's unsexy or something. It's right, like right. it's like people think you know people like Brady Spinellas and like they're like seeing rich kids right. do coke and like but have fun and be nihilists, like, yeah. or they like you know sort of hard scrabble lives of quiet sort of race. The preppy monster but, who like drives through the yeah. other one and Tom Wolfley drives up the homeless yeah. man who's like. Oh well, I don't care because I have money in them. You know, it's like yeah. it's like the sort of yeah, the middle. There's you know, there's nothing. There's sex, something sexy about money, and there's something sexy about having no money. But no, I would say like if you look at other media, though, like 
TV, The Office, Parks and Recreation, all these shows that we watch are set in the workplace, people making money. Most people spend most of their waking hours at a job. Um, and there's a way in which, and it's very much a part of visual art as well, and of course music, people sing about money and work. And it's odd that it seems in literature in particular, maybe it's because it's such a, a bougie pastime and that because it's so demanding, reading of novels sort of a lot to ask of somebody, like can I bend your ear for 15 hours uh, and you just have to pay $25 for the privilege of like, you know, listening to this story. It's sort of a, a sort of preposterous request of a person. Uh, that there's a kind of need for escapism, I think, that might be not as present in other forms of narrative, like in films. I mean, you know, The Wolf of Wall Street, there's so many films that explore. Well, because I think people love this narrative of like very rich people are corrupt and then they right. like, pay for it down the line. Right. But I think that's, that's like, that's also this really romantic and kind of reductive. Um, yeah, reductive narrative. I mean, one of the things, you know, we were sort of talking about earlier, and I wanted to quote a line from Peter's novel. So in, in his novel, this guy has, leaves his job at the World Bank. Right. Um, but he doesn't quite know why exactly right. he's done it. He's sort, yeah, of, of reasons, yeah. he's sort of made this kind of moralistic decision where he makes this big mm -hmm. speech. Um, but it, and you know he sort of decides he's he's not with them anymore in their ideals. But he also isn't sure who he is with. Right. Um, and there's this part where he says that it's most basic. And he's talking about sort of you know the problem of it's not like then you just go all the way to the left. And he says you know the problem at its most basic the allure of fundamentals, whether religious or ideological, liberal or conservative, is that it provides an appealing order to things that are actually disorderly.